All right. Welcome, welcome. Uh, this, I believe, is the 10th call. Um, no, mm, I'm not sure. Uh, last week, the meeting didn't actually get published because uh, after we did the recording, we got hit with a crazy ice storm. And I have had, out of the last seven days, very spotty internet for maybe four of them with complete outage being forced to use cellular connectivity for two or three of those. So after this recording gets processed, uh, I will probably upload them both. So people will get both of these recordings at the same time. Um, yeah, that was. it's been a crazy week. I, I will just leave it at that with technology and connectivity. Um, Today, the kind of the main focus is the state of the user interface and where we're at with that. If you are in the WarfKit Telegram channel, um, you've probably seen a lot of animated GIFs of like new functionality that's been coming in. Um, the kind of the long and the short of it is, is that we've been working on the components for this user interface implementation for for weeks now and we've been talking about a lot of plugins a lot of integrations and all of that um and just as of i want to say maybe over last weekend um all of the pieces started snapping together and so that's why it feels like suddenly things are accelerating so much faster um the groundwork was laid we had a lot of the pieces in place, and uh, as we'll see kind of in this video itself and what we'll talk about, it's just how they're clicking together now and how quickly we're going to be able to move on some of the components that are still outstanding. Um, the GitHub repository, we're actually up to 20 now. Two of them are public or private, uh, just because those are largely in development and we don't want people to try them yet. Um, I'm looking at this at a non-logged-in view just so it's less distracting. Uh, a lot of the progress and a lot of what we're going to jump into today is this web UI renderer. This is the user interface for web browsers. Uh, we've talked about it in the past. There's also the uh, console renderer for command line interactivity. Um, but I would say 99 some percent of the developers that are going to integrate Wharf and use it on some form of an antelope chain are going to be using this web UI renderer. Um, and hopefully, it's now going to be in a position where people will be able to give it a test drive here soon. Uh, we'll probably be releasing a technical preview of the web renderer. Uh, I don't have a timeline on that quite yet. It's something we're just starting to talk about now. Um, we're shifting, at least I am, I am shifting my mindset going from coding into explaining code. Um, and I, people on the team are also focusing on like how we document that now and how we start getting this in the hands of developers. So technical preview coming up soon. It'll explain how to integrate it into an application. Um, all of this is going to culminate in a 0 0.3 release. We're on 0 0.2, which was kind of the the sessions themselves being in a usable state. Um, 0 0.3 is the user interface being in, uh, I don't know if I want to call it usable, kind of a prototype state. Um, it is going to be lacking quite a bit. It is not the final design. It was uh, CSS that we just kind of slapped on it that kind of has some hints of where we're going with the UI. Um, but it is not optimized. It is not styled. It is not. It doesn't have that level of polish on it. Um, so still, with this being a technical preview that we're going to be releasing, we would not recommend it in a production environment. Um, it's not going to be mobile friendly. It's not going to support probably all the wallets that you may want it to. Um, and things are just going to be subject to change based on the feedback of the developers that are integrating it. So. Um, what it will have when it is released is accessibility to use uh, jungle test accounts directly in the browser using private keys. Uh, and it will also support the Wax Cloud Wallet as well as Anchor. Those are kind of the two plugins that are in an almost release ready state. Um, there will probably be bugs in them, which you know we would appreciate people helping us track down. This, 
all of this software is just usable in so many different ways, it's almost impossible to catch all the edge cases. So we're excited for people to try it, people to break things, and see what kind of things it can't do that you know your application may demand. So, uh, so I guess just to kind of dive straight into that, um, the web UI renderer itself is two things. Uh, one of them is the quote unquote UAL replacement. It is the thing that provides the wallet login interface. It facilitates transaction signing. It, um, it is, it's the UI wrapped around that that would show in anybody's web application. Um, this is built in a way that if developers want to build their own UI renderers uh, to like you know bake it into their application and make it look exactly like their application, this is all based on standards that can be followed to build your own interface. Uh, but this is an interface that you can just drop in like UAL and it will provide that functionality. Um, the other thing this repository is, which these two folders pretty much represent, is a testing framework. Um, it, all of our other projects to date have had testing frameworks that are driven on unit tests. And this one, being a graphical user interface, needed something different. So this test folder itself is actually a single HTML application that implements the entirety of the web renderer with the session kit in a really suboptimal way to create an interactive uh, environment that you can test out the user interface, wallet integration, transaction plugins, login plugins, all of those things. Um, you would just be able to publish your own stuff and then include it in the test file. You know, maybe it's you modify this file directly to pull your plugin in and then you implement your plugin. Um, it is almost 500 lines of HTML and JavaScript, completely self-contained. Uh, the only dependency is the bundle that this that the renderer builds, uh, which also includes all of the other dependencies. And then it uses a CSS framework, and that's it. There's no external logic. The entire logic for this application is in this file. And if you are working with the web UI renderer, when you run Yarn Dev, which is the command to launch development mode, it launches a local copy of this that'll do live reloading based on your changes. Um, it'll let you do some quick workarounds to be able to test specific interactions. Um, I have uh, personally lived in this environment for weeks now. Um, whether it's I'm working on the autocorrect plugin or the Explorer link plugin or the Wax Cloud wallet or the private key, like this is where I go to actually test that interaction in a user environment. And I am hopeful that other developers, as they're building whatever it is that they're building, will then be able to help or to be able to leverage this environment themselves to test out whatever it is that they're building. That is part of Wharf. I mean, if you're building your own application, you can use your own application. Um, but if you are actually working on like a, a distributable component for this suite of tools, uh, like maybe you wanted to build a plugin that, um, sorry, after you bought an NFT on an NFT pack of some kind on some website that you wanted to open it immediately afterwards. That's a great uh, potential plugin use case. And if you wanted to just test that interaction flow without maybe the um, complexities of your own application, this is a straightforward way to do that. And I guess to kind of show that, um, there's now a live copy running at ui-test.warfkit.com. This is the master branch. Uh, any pull request made against um, this repository for changes in how the UIs function or what the styles look like or anything to that regard will also be deployed somewhere in that pull request using the same deployment process. Um, it gives you very simple tools. Like if you actually just want to log in with anything, you can you click login and it triggers the renderer's login method. Again, these are just my crappy design skills login or user interface designs. This is not final. 
Um, I want to make that very clear because this isn't what you should expect out of the actual uh, polished release and what production applications will be using. Those will look much nicer. Um, but in a testing sense, to be able to test the functionality and the experience, you can use this login to test any wallet plugin, including you know one that you may be building. Um, there's a couple other buttons here for you to be able to launch Jungle 4 accounts with specific configurations, like this test account. Um, you just click it, it'll automatically log you into that account. The private key is loaded into the testing application, so you can just use it. This one with resources on it has a ton of resources. Uh, it can do as many transactions as it needs to. Uh, it's bound to only do token transfers, and that's also why it has a large token balance. Um, this one, on the other hand, doesn't have any CPU. So if we log into this one, you can see that like, if I say I want to broadcast a transaction, it doesn't have CPU. So this one like, is specifically powerful for letting you test error flows and error correction flows. Um, and same goes with no RAM. Like, If you log into this account with no RAM, it also doesn't have CPU and net, but it also doesn't have enough RAM to do anything. Um, I guess just kind of as a quick primer on this, like that's the login. You can log in with any account. There's a ton of testing accounts loaded to this private key. They're all only allowed to do token transfers, like the accounts themselves you can't do anything else with. Um, but if you pick private key and then you pick jungle, it will list all of them. In the readme for the session kit, it defines what all of these are. Um, there is a... Uh, I can just pull it up real quick. Uh, in the test folder in utilities, we've got the setup and accounts. These are a list of them. It shows kind of the matrix of configuration for all of these accounts. So if you want to test an account without CPU, which was the one that we just logged in with a second ago, you can use WarfKit 1112. And this 1113 has no rent or net. 1114 has no RAM, 1115 has no resources at all, and then flip it where they don't have tokens and some other pure permutations of it. Um, this no op cosine acts kind of like a gray mass fuel, and it has plenty of all resources. Um, but this private key signer will let you log in with all of them, as well as a couple extras. So you can just pick any of them you want and they will work as well. These don't require wallet interaction, but it does use the session kit and the UI elements just like a wallet would. Like It's going to behave just like Anchor was responding without needing to use Anchor. I know for my testing purposes over the years, I can't tell you how many test signing requests I've signed in Anchor. And uh, just having this key user interface baked in has made testing so much easier in that regard. Um, it uses all the exact same interfaces. So if it works from a UI perspective with the private key, it will work from a UI perspective with Anchor or any other wallet. So um, you can log out of in the individual account. You can switch accounts. You can log out all accounts. You have an account status. And then this is the control to test um, the transactions. Again, all of these accounts, all they do is token transfers. The key is limited to only allow token transfers. Um, and all of these just modify how the transfer is being done. So I guess just as an example, with an account with resources, if we wanted to just broadcast uh, with no plugins, we're just going to call transact. It transacted, says, you know, there's a little log down here at the bottom. You can view it on an explorer. This launches EOSQ from EOS Nation to look at the jungle stuff. You can see this is the transaction we just did in the browser. Um, and yeah, I mean, at the very basic level, that's what this does. You can disable broadcasting if you don't want to broadcast, though the user interface is going to change if you don't broadcast. Um, like, you're not going to get, like if I go to this one, this was the one without CPU, and I say broadcast and transact, it's going to throw an error. If broadcast was off, it's not going to throw an error because it was never actually sent to the network, and there, there's no errors. As far as the wallet is concerned, there were no errors. Um, and as far as the user interface is concerned, since it was never broadcast. So 
Uh, jumping back to this one real quick, these other options, we have this mock plugin, which I think we talked about a couple weeks ago in Telegram. Um, the entire purpose of the mock plugin is to play with the user interface. You can trigger various things. By default, it pops up with an accept decline prompt that times out after five seconds. This is a good tool to help you uh, style these elements if you were you know, designing a user interface um, and to show how these flows uh, move from one another, you know, and making sure that things like the timeout are actually working. If I were to actually accept that the transaction proceeds, uh, it actually broadcasts because that account has it. Uh, again, if we want to test going from a user interface prompt into an error, we could use this one that has no CPU and use the mock plugin. It's like, do you accept? Yeah, OK, well, we still get the error. There was no corrective measures taken. Um, there's also this Explorer link plugin. Uh, I was looking at potentially baking in some sort of, you know, end of transaction flow prompt for, you know, your transaction successful. Do you want to see it on iBlock Explorer? Like the application's doing it here. But if you wanted a mock up afterwards, like this is a plugin that after broadcasting, prompts with the user interface that never expires and gives you the Explorer link. This, I don't know how many people are actually going to use this. It was very quick to develop, actually. Um, but goes to show that like here, you can do something after the transaction is done. That was kind of the primary reason I did that. And then again, this opens EOS Q, goes to the Block Explorer, and shows you the transaction. Uh, the last three are all corrective measures that you can have take. So like they won't actually do much if there's no errors. Um, but if I go back to this no CPU account and use the cosigner one, there's a that gray mass or not gray mass um, that wharf kit no op account that was loaded in that account matrix. It will sign any transaction given to it with the key for that, just as a complete prototype example. Like if I do it with no plugins, we get the error. If I cosign the transaction with the transact with this plugin, the transaction actually works. It went through. We look at it on Block Explorer. You can see that there was a no-op action appended to it with the WharfKit no-op account, which is not the account we used. We used 1112. Um, and that assumed the resource costs of this transaction. So if we ever get, or I shouldn't say ever, uh, that's too pessimistic, um, when we get contract signing or uh, the ability to put a key in the front end to cosign transactions, this is the plugin that we'd use. Uh, from a back end perspective, you could use this plugin right now. And since your keys are all stored safely, it would just, you know, you'd be using it to cosign locally in your Node.js application, in your bot, in your script, whatever. Still works out here on the front end, but just to show. Um, this. Resource provider plugin is a generic plugin for resource providers like Fuel. This is actually hooked up to Fuel on um, Jungle 4. So when you trigger it, it goes out and it says, hey, there's a transaction fee. I think it's because I've burned through so many resources. Um, all of this is being done by the plugin itself, by the resource provider plugin. I think there's a timeout that is going that is actually going to expire this prompt if the transaction expires. Uh, and you can either accept or decline. And if you decline, we get the error, like the transaction proceeded. It said, you know, I declined the fee, but I still want to keep going. Um, and if you, I think if you accepted, it actually should work as well. Yep. So in this instance, we actually see the no-op action. We see the fee being paid to fuel. And then we see the original action being done by the account. So this is our typical fuel setup that you'd see on EOS and Telos and Wax, uh, how it works. The no-op action was signed by Gray Mass Fuel. So Gray Mass Fuel assumed the resource costs. Um, and it just, you know, it makes that user experience just that much a little bit easier. This will work on any wallet plugin. It's working with the wallet private key plugin right now. Uh, it works with the Wax Cloud wallet. It'll work with Anchor. It'll work with any other wallet that gets added into this. So I know that was one of the big things in the Wallet Plus blue paper we wrote like a year ago that we wanted to achieve with this. And 
that's showing it in action now with this tool. Um, super excited to see where that goes. And then this last one's kind of an experiment that we have right now to offer fuel like compatibility without fuel to like decentralize it. Um, I think I may have mentioned this in Telegram, but I don't know if I've mentioned it on a video. It's this autocorrect plugin. It will automatically attempt to correct issues with a transaction before it performs the transaction. So again, with this account with no resources, this is going to fail because the account cannot do anything besides transfer tokens. Um, but you can see it popped up and it's trying to use power up to power up the account during the token transfer. Now this uh, this 1112 account doesn't have permission to power up and that's why it's going to fail. But if you accept it, it's giving you an authority error because the transaction that was actually sent was a power up plus the transaction that was requested. And it will do this for both CPU and RAM right now. So if the account needs RAM, it'll pop up and say, you know, you needed RAM to perform this transaction. Uh, this account was supposed to test that, but uh, it does not anymore because I uh, did it once and it bought RAM. <laughs> so I kind of broke the test account. I'll have to make a new one that can reproduce this, but it, it's not a reproducible error because it's always going to be buying additional RAM. And yeah, long story short. So yeah, that is this testing framework. Um, you can, if you, once we have the Anchor plugin in, you'll be able to actually use this to test on any network. Um, we're configured to use all of the test nets. Uh, most of the major live blockchains, it uses Jungle 4 as well. You know, it's kind of a standalone test net. Um, so if you have Telos test nets accounts or Wax test nets, test net accounts, like you'll be able to use them in this interface to test out Wharf. Or plugins um, and everything else. So this will always be the live version. Whenever we merge to master, this URL will be updated. Um, and we've got a link out to the renderer itself as well. So this all in all, like we're getting really close to the point where we're going to have a release candidate and that technical preview um, of how the inter user interface functions and replaces UAL. So super excited about this. It's been, I don't even know, a month, month and a half of pretty intense work on the UAL side of this. Um, and yeah, hopefully we will have a really solid version to be able to do early access implementations and then maybe this week, like maybe by the time people see this video, unless I post it today. So. I've been going for about 20 minutes, so I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> Did you guys have any questions about how this works or where it's at or anything like that? Yeah, it's great to see all these uh, uh, different accounts set up to facilitate the testing. Thank you for showing us. Yeah, not a problem. Um, and if you, like, I guess for you guys or anybody else on this call, uh, if you want this to work on another test net for whatever reason, um, if I go back into the session kit, um, the make file uh, has this, where is it at? Probably at the bottom. Yeah. You can run make accounts. And what this does is it runs the TS node against this file, this test utilities file. Um, which if I jump over to real quick uh, setup, it is this file. This is a script that uses the session kit to load. Like the only thing I think you have to change is you have to put a private key in here. We didn't put the private key for like the master account, which is this guy right here. Um, but you put in the private key and then there's just this big array of test accounts and like how many resources, how, like what balance should we give them? How much should we stake? How much RAM? How much net? Um, and it'll run through and create every account in here uh, as well as configure their permissions. Like there's the delegate RAM or the delegate call. Here's where it buys RAM. Here's where it calls update auth. It creates a permission called test 
using the test key that is embedded within all of our tests, including the UI front end. Um, and then it links that to just only allow it to do EOS IO token transfers. So if like some developer has a local test net, or if one of the network's test nets wants these accounts to be able to test out against uh, the framework itself, like all it needs to be done is this master account needs to be created with the appropriate permissions and the private key needs to be loaded. Uh, the URL and the chain ID probably need to be updated too, but um, then you just run make accounts and it will cycle through and check for existence, check for authentic like correctness and create those accounts. So this is how all of those were created in the first place. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I was going to ask for advice on, on because I have my own local Nodios mm -hmm. that I run sometimes with with its own changes to it. Um, yeah. And so I was going to ask on your advice on how what the difficulty was of setting up some of the same uh, Wharf uh, UI renderer and, and tests yeah. that you have here. Yeah. It looks like it's really easy. That's amazing. Yeah, I I did it by hand like twice. That's if you if you look at the actual uh, login, you'll notice some other weird account names. Uh, well, I mean they're all weird, but like these start with T two, and then there's some T E threes. These were like some done by hand instances uh, until finally I got fed up and was just like, okay, now I, now we have a script. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm with you. I did the same thing for Bob and Alice on EOSJS. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, this and if you go in and like you run it once, and then if you come down to the bottom and you add a new account, you can run it again, and it won't fail trying to create the old ones. Like it actually does check for existence and corrects. Like it can be used it live to continuously update on a network if you need it to. So it's just. It's like you're hydrating the network with test accounts. <laughs> I love how it's recursive. It, it uses itself to build itself. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely uh, dog fooding everything. So there's also a lot of EOSIO core best practices in here. Um, I don't, yeah, you can see that I have a structs file that uh, defines all of the actions that it's going to be taking. These were generated by ABI to core, which is a utility that we have. Um, and it just prevents the API calls needed to generate these actions. So it's kind of a nice optimization. So yeah, but it is a self-contained little utility there that lives in the tests folder for some reason, along with the 120 some odd tests that actually exist there. Um, and I guess just as a note, if you're ever looking for the most recent code, it may not be in dev. Like right now, it's all in here. This It's 100 commits ahead of dev right now. <laughs> one, one question, Aaron, on, on this. So you suggested if somebody was trying to build their own plugin, you'd use this. Is, is it the suggestion that you would just add your plugin and make a PR and then look at this being rendered in the PR? Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. The way that I've been doing it, and I definitely want to document this uh, somewhere, um, is that if you clone down the UI renderer and you, know, you run yarn install and you get it all set up, if you run yarn dev, this is what launches on localhost. And while it's running, what you can do is use the yarn link command and link it to a uh the the plugin you're developing that's also on your local host um and then you can like this will continue to be running on your local machine you know you'll get to it from local host i think it's 8080 is the port um and with your in development plugin being yarn linked uh every time you make your plugin this will automatically refresh and include your changes uh the only thing that does need to be done that link is broken. Or yeah, it is. The, I think it's the at sign. I noticed the same oh. thing as I clicked it. Yep, you are absolutely right. Um, in the test folder, the only thing that needs to be done is this TypeScript file. 
this is what's exporting all of the other dependencies and bundling it all together. So you would just add your plugin name here, and then it would be accessible in the this file that then you could include. So two places you have to modify, one being the TypeScript and the other being this HTML file. But it creates this really nice development environment where you have this tool running, the web renderer test, that is live reloading with the changes to your plugin uh, as you're working on it. We're pretty much building all of the wallet plugins and the transact plugins this way. Okay. Cool. I need to like write that down as a, a blog post for developers. <laughs> yeah, the, when I first read it, it's the way you presented it, and I clicked around yesterday when I saw the link was uh, that you could like somehow go here and like load it through this UI on this deployment of it, but um, that didn't make sense. And I figured that would yeah. be serious voodoo. Um, but yeah, the, the yarn link makes the most sense. Yep. And then there's obviously some caveats around that with how yarn link works. But if you're familiar with how that works, um, it's super easy. I typically like I was actually working on a experimental plugin yesterday and i just cloned down the um what is it called i think it's the transact plugin template template um template yeah this guy i just cloned this down created a new one ran yarn link against it and then linked it to the um ui renderer and then put the class name in that one file and then edited the HTML and I had this like live development environment to build a new plugin. So we'll definitely write that down real quick. Cool. Looks good. The I think <laughs> this probably doesn't matter to too many people, at least in the current ecosystem right now. But the development experience around building these plugins is is really crisp. Um, it's super easy to work with. There are a couple gotchas, like, and most of them come with just using Yarn Link. Like, you don't want to you want to make sure you destroy all the links and then compile from the actual sources before you publish, because sometimes you get caught in this uh, weird local dependency configuration that makes it seem like something's going to work, but it doesn't actually work. Um, but yeah, we'll have to kind of dive into that and in some sort of guide about plugin development. Um, uh, Mass. Just a, this is kind of an older version, but like it, we have some of our apps running test versions now. You can see this is like an even older version, um, but. Like that same user interface, once we update this, will be the same thing where, you know, like you pick your wallet, you pick the account if you need to pick an account, and then like you can just put this interface in your applications. Um, I think that this works. Yep. Um, so imagine this is anybody else's application. This is kind of just to illustrate that. This will be usable in other things besides this renderer test. But if you just really want quick ways to be able to do the development work, this is by far the easiest. Like you saw the multiple steps I had to go through here to get to that interface. And that's not because it's a bad interface. It's just a different interface as opposed to uh, just literally being able to click the button. <laughs> it does something for you. Uh, I guess another thing to note, which we talked about in Telegram, uh, but didn't haven't talked about on a call or in any more public settings, um, is that we added support for localization and all of the the base user interfaces. Like you see, the actual text changes here. Um, it updates. These are automatically translated. I don't know what they say honestly. I hope it's not cursing people out. 
Um, we need to do real translations still for these, but um, the web UI renderer itself is now responsible for all translations. Um, so if you're using the session kit just in a backend application, it's not going to have any translations. But when you're working in the user interface world, it's going to have translations. And plugins themselves also have translations. So like this text right here is a localization definition from the plugin um, that is then being merged into the UI kit and um, surfaced through the UI kit. So right so now you, we've hmm? you're studying the language through the developer console, not through yeah. the drop down. Yeah. Well, is I mean this an option this, did, through an option, is that what you said? Through like a drop down. Just because like if, if I went to Shanghai, I would not want to see it in, in you know Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's because it's reading off this locale string. Like this is just the Chrome way of doing it. I see. OK. So like, if I change that back to English, even though it's on uh, the but what same. Is, what drives the locale string? I guess Chrome. I would tell Chrome if I Chrome yeah. ready that I'm an English speaker. And if I go to Shanghai, it shouldn't change. I Correct. Sure. I'm just used to um, you know, drop downs. Like, you know, you usually do the flags and a drop down in the actually application to pick the language. Yeah, we're using the navigator's language string right here. OK, so that should be based on the user's preference in the browser. Yep. And I mean, you bring up a point, though, that maybe we want developers to be able to set that as well. Um, like maybe you have a language selector in your application, and you want that to override whatever is in here. Um, that doesn't exist yet, but we should probably add that. Yeah, I mean, implicit's nice until you want to be explicit. And then yeah. if you can't be explicit, then you get kind of pissed off. Yep. So that was another major feature that came in and kind of a architectural challenge um, just to get to the point where we could have translations. Uh, like this is the template. And you can see there is a translations.json. Uh, we may be changing how this works. It, it doesn't depend on this file name. But what it does is it actually loads it and then bakes it into the plugin. But we may change it so that way it's asynchronously loaded. So that way it isn't just part of your package size always. Right now it is. Um, but right now we're just importing the JSON. And then it is this property on a plugin that is optional. Like you don't have to do this in a plugin at all. Um, but it is a feature now of the transact plugin framework. All the plugins, actually, the wallets allow for it too. Um, and then there's no other code that necessarily needs to be done, but the plugin can use the translations as well. Um, there's this context UI get translate, which gives you this function, which I'm just calling T for abbreviated purposes. And then as you're rendering out strings, you can say, I want to render the before sign uh, key. And here's the default value. And it will find and do the translation so long as you have the definition. When you're looking at the um, kind of the sequence here, so you have all mm -hmm. these plugins that handle resources. If there was a wallet that was doing resources for the user, um, they would need to do that before. like there, to avoid conflicts with that, they would have to have set up the transaction before they call the signer, which I guess is probably the most logical way from a wallet's perspective anyway, right? So like, yeah, if I'm going to set up a co-signing uh, for my users, I would do that before I called transact or whatever your you know, the name is. Um, yeah. And then when you get it, your plugins would honor that right, they would use all the Node.js plugins to determine that they, they wouldn't. I, I mean, you see what I'm getting at? Like, they don't need to look mm -hmm. at the transaction, but they need to run the transactions as they're given. And and then, in theory, if the application or the wallet had properly co-signed and handled resources already, then your plugins would say it's fine. You don't need any resources, which 
actually the, would be like a no op for the user. And it wouldn't be that they don't need resources. It would be that the transaction already contains the necessary actions to cover resources, right? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of places where we have that baked in. Um, like here, you can see that this is the this is the hook that goes through and runs the before sign hooks. Um, and if signatures are returned in any of the before sign hooks, it sets the allow modify flag to be false, which will then throw errors if any other, uh, well, actually it doesn't throw errors, I don't think, but it disallows modifications from any future um, plugin or the wallet plugin itself. Um, so that will catch if like a before sign hook co-signed the transaction and then the wallet tried to modify the transaction. Um, so pretty much the stance we're taking is that the first time a signature is returned, whether it be from a plugin, a transact plugin or a wallet plugin, nobody else can modify the transaction moving forward. You can keep appending signatures, but you can no longer modify it. Um, and if wallets try, it's going to throw an error, I believe. Uh, like this right here says if the wallet returned a request, we're going to check and see if the transactions are equal. Like this will do a deep comparison of the two transactions and make sure that it wasn't changed. And if it was changed, we need to make sure it modifications were allowed and if modifications were not allowed we're just going to throw an error it's like this was an invalid configuration provided so in my example the before sign well it's almost as if i, I guess i don't know exactly what entities live in these stages but you know if, if the application <laughs> itself was co-signing they'd check their API, have their API sign it, and like Worf in the session kit wouldn't even see a transaction until it already had a signature. Like you'd receive a transaction with a signature. That signature would be the cosign, right? Um, and then I guess if there's a wallet, the wallet would register its resource management as a before sign hook, right? In theory, if they're doing that. Yeah, I, I don't. There is not going to be any checking if the application signs it before Wharf gets a hold of it. Um, realistically, what should be happening is, is that the transaction should just be given to Wharf without being co-signed. And then if the application wants to co-sign, they should be using a plugin. Um, because there's no way for Wharf to know what's happening outside of it, if that makes any sense. Or even before it gets it. Yeah. Like most of the time, like, you know, if we looked at the demo, you know, you're going to see most applications are passing in like fragments of transactions that they, they don't even have like uh, the headers or anything like right. that. Right. Give you an actions array. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so most of the time, like applications aren't going to have signed it at already at that point. They're going to be right. calling transact and then that all gets assembled. Uh, and I would hope that uh, any developer that wants to co-sign to cover stuff is going to be using these before signed hooks. And we have a number of these uh, available already for that purpose, um, like the resource provider plugin that uses the Fuel API standard to create signatures. Uh, Autocorrect doesn't need additional signatures. And the co-signer, you just pass in a private key for this one to work, and it'll sign and co-sign transactions automatically. Um, like you can see the configuration of it right there. You just passed in a transact plugin that was a co-signer, and you said, this is the account, this is the permission, and this is the key, and it will sign every transaction with a no-op um, using this information. So that would be running on the server API that the app would have to host themselves. Yes, not for this plugin, but this one will just do it in the browser. This is assuming we hit a point where you can embed private keys in applications and co-sign that way, and those keys are somehow limited to only do those specific things. Um, it's, it's possible people might, you know, really balk at seeing the private key there, but it's yeah, entirely safe to do. I mean, we, yeah, we have the, that for our EVM RPC. There's a key that 
all it can do is sign transactions for the EVM, which charge gas. And I would be fine if that key was in the wild, but I think people would would panic if they saw that in the wild, especially with yeah. how much CPU and net is delegated to it. But the only thing that key can do is sign transactions that have a fee. So exactly. You can't abuse it. Um, that and that's precisely what that cosigner plugin is for, is situations where you have a secured environment like that. If you want to do a backend implementation where, like with Fuel, where you submit and say, hey, hey, Fuel, I want to do this transaction, and Fuel analyzes it and then um, returns a modified transaction along with a signature for the user to accept, that's where this resource provider plugin comes from. And I think like the example I'm thinking of is like, you know, an app that wants to pay for their users transactions on their contract, they need to inspect the transaction and make sure that they're, you know, first only call no op, second only call no op to sign a transaction, you know, only sign a transaction where no op is the first action and their actions are the subsequent actions, right? Like, yep. Yeah. You know, so I don't think you could do that in a browser implementation like you're showing. You'd have to yeah. do that on the server. Yeah. And that's yeah, that's exactly where this one comes in too. Like you can see, there's no uh, the resource provider plugin doesn't have it has configuration. I'm not using it any of it right this second. Um, but this one is all API driven, and there are no keys baked into it. Uh, that's a bad. So that's the client that. side there. The resource provider is right. Uh, the resource provider one is the one that depends on the API. It but it, uses this, a, this is the code that would run in the client, and then you'd build the API, and this would basically correct. The API. Yeah. Correct. And we have one of those, uh, which should just work out of the box with this. Um, that's an API client. Uh, it's in here somewhere. We have yeah. too many repos. Yeah. But yeah, there's a standalone Node.js application that runs this API, will accept transactions, and then co-sign them, returning a signature. And that's kind of the counterpart to what this plugin does. Um, and then this plugin you can configure. Uh, it takes resource provider options, which are resource yeah, provider like options. Points. Yeah. yeah, you specify the endpoint to your API. You can specify whether fees are allowed, what a max fee is. Uh, there's this, which will be implemented in the future of allowed actions. Um, and then the entire point of this plugin is to, when it makes a request, it validates it. It gets the endpoint for it. Uh, it makes the URL that follows the resource provider specification. And then it goes out and calls that API and then does some validation on the response and ultimately gives back to Wharf uh, the modified request and the signatures that are needed from the API. So there's no keys going back and forth. Um, this works out of the box with Fuel. Like this is not a Fuel plugin, but it works with Fuel. So, and by default, that's why uh, our API endpoints are hard coded in, because you can just call it with any of these blockchains and that plugin will make fuel work with this. But like if you ran your own, you could just replace the URL, it would work. Cool. These plugins have been super interesting to work on. <laughs> So yeah, I think that's pretty much all I had to cover today. There were some other topics in Telegram, um, which we can pick up there. Are there any other burning questions or comments or anything on this regard uh, before we maybe wrap today up? The 30 seconds. come a long ways and since the beginning of the year so super excited to get this in people's hands uh hopefully in the coming weeks i will also be out in the wild as well as maybe some of our other developers actually helping do some of this integration in other people's applications that may be receptive to it uh it's not going to be ready to be merged obviously because you know 
the user interface we've been looking at, again, is temporary and not mobile friendly and not feature complete. Um, but at least starting to do the work is probably good at this point, because we don't think a lot's going to change. So inching closer to a new future. Cool. All right, well, we are going to wrap this one up here then.